Exodus from London takes place, young people whom their parents had wisely registered for evacuation taking train for the West Country. The railways provided one of the stages for the human drama of the Second World War. The railway platform and the departing train were carrying the evacuated child, the soldier, sailor or airman, or even the prisoner or displaced person. Each and all travelling to unknown and fearful destinies provide us with some of the most abiding images of the war years. One of the first jobs of the railway in Britain was to carry away the children of the cities and towns to be safe from air attack. This scene on the LNER shows something of the railway at war. This was a world where everybody seemed to be on the move, but everybody's journey had to be necessary. The war brought dramatic change to the entire railway network. War was declared on 3rd September. On the 4th, Plans for mobilization meant that the Great Western Railway alone ran 320 special troop trains and a further 350 carrying ammunition, fuel and other military supplies. These sequences are from a special series of films shot for the DWR, recording wartime conditions at various stations on the Great Western system in the week running up to Christmas in 1941. The film provides a quite vivid picture of travel under wartime conditions. The most dramatic change from peacetime is the sheer numbers crowding onto platforms and cramming into trains. When we remember that before the war there was actually an oversupply of trains, that it was a time when a traveller could enjoy space and privacy, it is clear that this was a world turned upside down. Quite simply, there were less trains as so much rolling stock and timetable space was taken over by military traffic. Trains became incredibly long, sometimes to a length of 26 coaches, using two separate platforms. The first half of the train pulling out, and then reversing on to pick up and couple with the rear portion. These enormous trains would then crawl slowly away, perhaps with every single space filled, perhaps blacked out through the night, perhaps stopped and shunted aside many times to make way for more important traffic. The railways were, of course, regarded as valid targets for strategic bombing. But if high priority was given to the targeting, then high priority was given to repairs. Damage to essential routes was quickly made good. Just as the RAF was defined in Germany, essential services could be quickly repaired and large and heavy pieces of capital equipment, solid pieces of heavy engineering, such as steam locomotives, were actually quite hard to damage, so irreparably that the engine was lost completely. Figures show the surprising fact that throughout the entire war in the entire country, a total of only eight locomotives were completely destroyed by bombing. The sad fact is that while the damage caused by direct enemy assault was negligible and easily mended, the damage caused by overwork, neglect and government policy was far greater. Just as trains were worked doubly overloaded, so the railway system was doubly loaded both technically and financially during the war. Locomotives were not maintained to the standards necessary. They were made to soldier on with worn out parts, with neglect leading to greater damage. Just as with locomotive stock, so with the rolling stock and the permanent way. Both were sacrificed for victory. Even in the quality of fuel supplied for locomotives, the railways were asked to make sacrifices. Wartime conditions meant that the engines had to run on low-grade coal that reduced their performance and gave them a bad diet, magnifying the problems caused by the minimal maintenance. The human population was living on powdered egg, 
the locomotive population, its carboniferous equivalent. Now, it might be thought that as a result of all the extra traffic in both passengers and freight, and the fact that double-length crowded trains might be slow, but they are very cost-effective, bringing a good return, that the railways might have been highly profitable. In fact, the government took steps to prevent the railways becoming war profiteers. The state clawed back all extra revenues, leaving the railway companies with run-down track, worn-out engines, carriages and wagons, and infrastructure almost inoperable, while denying the money and resources with which to make good the damage and return to health. Although many railway jobs are vital jobs, essential to war economy, there was still a labour shortage. Just as in all areas of British industry, women played their part in winning the war, taking the jobs of men who were away. Although not found on the footplate, women worked as locomotive cleaners, doing the dirty work of motive power departments all over the country. Women did the dangerous and demanding work of permanent way maintenance. Signal women controlled train movements on some of the busiest lines and were to be found in many of the maintenance branches of railway service. Women took the important role of train guard. And just as with all areas of British industry where women took a wartime role, these workers were to disappear back into the traditional women's world of the family and of home to the office and shop with the coming of peace. One wonders how many had regrets. Come and tanks which had been secretly concentrated and taken to the places of embarkation. Talk about South 25,000 special trains ran in the two months up to D-Day, transporting the armies of many nations. The railways were a crucial part of the war economy that brought victory. ...equipment of every kind and with a complement of fighting men, American and British, deserve the highest possible praise. The vast majority of people intended to make the most of their first post-war Easter. As it was, the people put out of the crush and the railways cut through the... This newsreel from 1946 shows the first holiday period. The sight of a coronation streamliner now shrouded in plain black, painfully pulling away with a multitude of leaks, shows the neglect endured during the war. In some places, there were attempts to get back to normal. ...the golden arrow train in which you can travel in complete comfort to the coast. After crossing the channel, you board the train again in front. If only this kind of travel were typical of journeys everywhere in Britain. But, well, maybe that's too much to hope for yet. It would be very wrong to say that the railways in the post-war period were either standing still or simply trying to recapture old glory. There was innovation, improvement and progress. The LMS built the first mainline diesel. And here's a newsreel report of the first mainline electric locomotive built for the London and North Eastern Railway to work the old Great Central Main Line. The sight of what is a comparatively modern looking locomotive, decked out in the lettering and livery of one of the old Big Four railways, must be a thought provoking sight to the modern eye in a time when liveries change by the day. Just as the Great War of 1914-18 brought massive change on Britain's railways, so World War II brought about the most significant of changes. Full state control, nationalization. The new Labour government of Clement Attlee was pledged to nationalization for reasons of social principle rather than railway practicalities. The big idea that was never carried through was to also nationalize road transport, canals and docks and create a completely coordinated national transport policy. Here at Derby Works in 1948, a former LMS locomotive rolls out a new, for those of you watching in black and white, green livery. It's often said by defenders of state control that nationalization was completely inevitable due to the state of the system in the post-war years. The GWR was the only company to have made anything like a realistic profit in 1939. The LNER and the LMS, for all their glamour, were almost insolvent. In fact, it was the effect of state control during the war that had brought the railways to such a sorry condition. 
It was the state that had starved the railways of income during the war, and the state that had caused the system to be thrashed into the ground through a lack of money for replacements and repairs. So was there an alternative to nationalization? Yes, the state could have repaid the debts it literally owed the railways for their sacrifice in the war. This would have given the railways the resources to rebuild, to expand. The private railway companies could have expanded into road haulage, bus companies and air transport, as they were doing before the war, and produced a coordinated policy based on commercial reality rather than political belief. And we would today have the position of railways owning the bus and coach companies. There was a huge need for new investment in what today we call the infrastructure of the railways, but post-war Britain had a huge shopping list with the creation of the National Health Service, the welfare state and improvements in education, and rebuilding the railways was a step too far. As it was, what really changed were the names painted on the side of the engines, and that decisions which should have been based on sound railway operation began to be taken by civil servants and politicians. What did the people of Britain get? They got 20,023 locomotives in 448 different types, 16 electric locomotives, 53 diesels, just under one and a quarter million wagons of 480 different types, just under 20,000 route miles of track. At nationalization, the railway employed an astounding 700,000 people. A fascinating side story to the tale of nationalization is that the act of parliament that took the railways into state control actually made no reference to the name British Railways. The new system was created, but it had no formal name, and the title British Railways was an improvisation. If there was a national British Railway, was there such a thing as a typical British locomotive? If there is a typical British locomotive, it is the 060, be it an 060 tender or an 060 tank. These locos were the staple workhorses to be found on freight and passenger traffic alike. At nationalization of the 20,000 engines British Railways owned, more than one in three were 060s. When BR came to build its own locomotives, no 060s were built. Locomotive policy was one of the first areas where the new British Railways had to go to work and integrate the big four into one system. It was decided in 1951 to build a whole new family of standard locomotives that could eventually work the whole system, just ten designs. The wisdom of this is debatable. Other developed countries were investing in diesel and electric traction. Only three years later, the decisions taken to fade out steam altogether on Britain's railways, a wasteful change of mind. Many of those locomotives built in the 1950s would have had useful lives nearly to the present day. What was the idea? the basic thought that guided the designers of these standard locomotives. Maximum steam raising capacity, huge efficient boilers for each type of loco to guarantee plenty of power, high thermal efficiency making maximum use of the energy from the coal burned with large grates and internal steam circuitry and valves of the highest standards, simplicity as few working parts to look after and those parts to be easily reached and on view. For example, on this standard five locomotive, there is a simple arrangement of just two outside cylinders. There are no difficult to get at internal cylinders and motion. Key components were to be highly engineered drawing on the lessons and developments and technology that the war had wrought. The tender of the Class 5 has roller bearings on its axles, more reliable and needing far less maintenance. The idea of low maintenance and higher efficiency is carried throughout the design of the locomotive. The locomotive is fitted with a then innovatory oil pump, a mechanical oiler here being primed. This reduced the number of individual oilings needed before each journey. Some parts of the locomotive had sealed lubricating points, 
again all leading to less expensive labor and time in preparing the engine for the road. For there was drastic need to cut labor costs, the people were far more expensive in the post-war years and had far higher expectations. A low-paid job, which involved getting up very early to work with dirty and hot locomotives, did not attract applicants in the 50s. Of course, the extensive ritual of oiling and general preparation was still time-consuming, and that time spent before the run was mirrored by a long period spent disposing of the engine after a run. Equally, the new engines were to be easier to put to bed at night, with features such as a self-cleaning smoke box to remove one of the most dirty and unpleasant tusks intending to steam locomotives. Wheel arrangement and weight were optimized to ensure good adhesion and minimal slipping, making the new locomotives extremely sure-footed. The locos were to have the range, power and speed such that each class could handle mixed traffic be as happy handling an express or a freight. Pulling a light train very fast, or a heavy train powerfully, if slowly. These last steam locomotives to be built include among their number some of the most spectacular successes in locomotive design. In many ways, they succeeded in the aim of bringing together some of the very best principles from each of the old Big Four. It is a sadness, a waste of human ingenuity, that so many good working locomotives were to have such a short working life. There was an attempt in some places to get things back to normal. The Golden Arrow had resumed its run to the Channel very soon after the end of the war. This precursor to the Eurostar was an exercise in luxury. Passengers travelled in first-class Pullman comfort and transferred to ship for the Channel crossing. The war had so run down the system, poorly maintained track cannot stand fast running, that it was not until 1953 that any of the major long-distance non-stop expresses like the Golden Arrow began to reach pre-war standards. While the former southern lines were returning to the old glamour of continental travel, on the east coast route to Scotland, there was an attempt to recreate the pre-war years of the LNER. The train was called the Elizabethan. London, 9.35 a.m. And from King's Cross, a new train, the Elizabethan, sets out to inaugurate the Coronation Year Express service at Edinburgh, the longest non-stop railway journey in the world. Aboard, the Panto settle down, some of their morning pick-me-up, or maybe that breakfast they missed. We leave them in comfort while we film, from almost every angle, the thrills of this epic run, recalling those former pre-war record journeys to the north.
crossing the border, we average nearly a mile a minute and arrive at Waverley Station, Edinburgh, on time. 392 miles in six and three quarter hours. A record for a non-stop journey. Time, 4.20 p.m. So the Elizabethan starts a new age in railway history. Once the PR story is cleared aside, this new train was still three quarters of an hour slower than the 1939 timetable. Overall, most running times were even slower than those in 1913. In the West Country, the Cornish Riviera Express was revived. Here, the train stands awaiting the all clear, as befitting one of the most famous trains to work from Paddington. As it should be, the locomotive is a powerful king of the Great Western Railway. Watch for the porter walking through shot as the locomotive leaves. What has he been doing in front of the locomotive? Steam locomotives, more than any other form of transport, give the feel of a living creature, of something that has to be fed. This scene of coaling is timeless, something that's been happening for 150 years. Fed and watered, of something that has to be nursed through its journey. A locomotive is not the easiest of things to drive well. Now, each and every type of transport that people use has its own feel. What then is the feel of being in the cab, of driving a locomotive? <laughs> in some ways, driving a locomotive is like the more familiar experience of driving a car when starting, selecting a low gear, a late cut off on the reversing gear, taking off the brake, pressing the accelerator, opening the regulator to send power to the wheels, the engine slowly starts to move. Steel wheels and steel rail do not move with the same response of rubber on tarmac and the locomotive is gently encouraged up to speed. Once moving and picking up speed, the cutoff is changed, the equivalent of changing to a higher gear. Driving of steam locomotive is, of course, a two-person job, with extra work from the fireman in response to the engine working harder. The fireman watches steam pressure and water level, and there's a cab floor to be kept clear of loose coal. The engine beats faster as it works harder, climbing, doing more work, burning more coal. None of the great engineers ever satisfactorily solved the simple problem of looking past a long boiler barrel to watch ahead and spot signals. So it is a job of both crew to work together, look forward, checking both signals and the road ahead.
Knowledge of the road is important to driving all trains, more so on steam, when so much has to be done in addition to simply driving. The sensation of the cab is one of noise, of vibration, of being in the open air, directly aware of the environment through which the train runs, of feeling the locomotive work, of understanding its condition by vibration and sound, rather than the simple inspection of dial and gauges. This was a time when engine crews had more contact with others on the railway. For engine crews in the age of steam, the signalman was not a remote presence many miles away. Trains were not controlled by automatic signals. This film, shot in an LNER box, is one of the earliest automatic power-controlled signal systems. It does not control a main line, but a freight marshalling yard. The railways in the post-nationalization period endured increasing competition, particularly in the carriage of freight. The goods train in the past was a different animal. Freight was dealt with by the wagon. Individual trucks and vans went all around the country, attached to stopping freight trains, sorted and moved around in marshalling yards. It is hard to believe, but until 1953, there were legal restrictions on people moving their own goods in their own lorries. When these controls were lifted, a heavy blow was struck against rail freight. This process of shunting, sorting and rearranging trains became hopelessly uncompetitive compared to a road transport network delivering door to door. There were attempts made to rationalize the system by using these automated yards. In effect, these yards only delayed the impact of competition. Even with automation, the process still required an army of shunters to couple and uncouple the different wagons and sort the trains into the correct order. The work of the shunter running alongside heavy moving wagons, riding on the brake lever, appears to be hair-raisingly dangerous. In the yards, sometimes not just single trucks, but strings of wagons moved on their own with no locomotive. Shunting was a job requiring some strength and coordination. This shunter sprints alongside the trucks, while at the same time inserting the brick stick to work the wagon's own bricks. Railways were still, as today, one of the safest ways to travel, but in the 50s, newsreel cameras recorded a series of horrifying accidents. Four coaches plunged down the embankment after it. The train was an excursion from Wales. The immediate fatalities were 10, and the number of injured about 100. Nearly 300 passengers were aboard the train, and many miraculous escapes were reported, including that of the engine driver and the fireman. These pictures reveal the extent of the disaster. There are the points which possibly caused the accident. It took hours before the main line was clear. It was about a mile from Welling Garden City that the night express from Aberdeen crashed into the rear of a local train. Many coaches of the express were derailed and hung over onto their sides. But almost miraculously, there was only one fatality among the total of about 600 passengers travelling in the two trains. The lines were blocked till the next day, and the cause of the collision, potentially a big grave disaster, awaits close investigation.
Sutton Coalfield Station was closed and empty when the York to Bristol Express was derailed there. But all possible help was quickly on the spot and the work of rescue went on through the night. When the engine left the track, some reports say it jumped the points, nine out of ten coaches piled up into this terrifying mass of wreckage. The train carrying about 300 passengers at the time. Railwomen were quick to avert another disaster by succeeding in halting the Birmingham New York Express, 200 yards short of the wreckage. An early casualty list put the fatalities at 16 and injured many of them very seriously at over 40. Deep sympathy for those bereaved and all who suffered in this tragic accident has everywhere been expressed. It happened after six o'clock in the evening in thick fog. The worst railway accident in the history of the southern region and one of the worst in the history of British railways. A steam train from London to Ramgate crashed into the rear of an electric train to Hayes, which was stationary between St. John's and Lewisham stations. The collision wasn't all, for a bridge, the Nunhead flyover, was also involved in the crash, and it collapsed onto the last coach of the steam train. All through the night, rescue workers toiled by the light of flares to extricate the living, the injured, and the dead. The trains had been full of businessmen, rush hour travelers, and Christmas shoppers. Casualties were very heavy. Over 70 deaths were soon reported, and toll was expected to be even greater. Frightful pile up on the line was now a little clearer to see, and looking at it, the reason for the heavy casualty list became obvious. To all the bereaved, to all who suffered in this appalling tragedy, the deepest sympathy is everywhere expressed. The experience of the steam railway was more than simply the sight, sound, smell of the steam locomotive. The experience of the steam railway was the total of a mass of small details. The sound of trucks and wagons which were simply chained together, rather than precisely coupled. Of a world which was lit not by electricity, but by oil lamps. Even there. Oil lamps shone down on a pre-microwave, pre-fiber optic world, with the communications technology worked with simple telegraph wires. Signaling, which was mechanical, mirroring and mimicking human gesture. Where the area control was limited by a man's strength conveyed through wire and rod. Even the sound of wheel running on rail in the classic age was different. This was a time when 60-foot lengths of rail, bolted, not welded together, sat wedged in place by wooden keys and cast iron chairs, bolted to wooden sleepers. Trains don't sound like this anymore.
beginning of the end came in 1960. Swindon and a new locomotive that's already historic. The last steam loco to be built by British Railways. The official unveiling revealed its appropriate name. Evening Star points to the inevitable end of a very popular age, the age of steam. It's always been locos like this that made boys want to be engine drivers. An innocent might ask, why aren't steam locomotives used anymore? The answer is simple. What would you have to pay someone to tend to a steam locomotive needs? Labour for money rather than love. What a steam locomotive wants, what it needs, is a lot. A lot of care and attention. This Great Western Manor Class 460 has spent a day working up and down the preserved Seven Valley Railway. It has finished its day's work. But for those whose task it is to care for this engine, to make certain it stays a healthy engine, the day's work is not even half over. The first task is to coal the locomotive. It is easier to move to the coal when there is steam than to move a locomotive without steam. The crew of a steam locomotive cannot switch off, lock up or go home. As the engine returns to its base, people gather around, each waiting to play their role in the rituals of engine disposal. At one end, new fuel is loaded into the tender. Meanwhile, at the other, one of the most unpleasant jobs on the steam railway begins. As coal burns, and just as any fuel, it does not burn completely, some ash remains. While the locomotive is running, this ash is sucked through the boiler tubes. Some is blown up through the chimney, but some gathers and collects in the smoke box. For all but a small number of engines, there is no alternative but for someone to open the hot smoke box and shovel the ash out. Shoveled by hot, dirty and dusty shovel, to do the thorough job needed means to get right inside the box of the still hot locomotive, reaching right inside with special tools to reach into every nook and cranny of the engine. In the cab, a start is made on cleaning the fire. The smoke box door is cleaned to make certain of the airtight fit, which is needed when running for the engine's exhaust system to do its job properly. The door is screwed very tight.
The engine rolls forward on its remaining steam. The engine will now remain static for the rest of its disposal. The boiler is filled with water. Once again, this is something much harder to do with a cold engine, as boiler pressure is needed to work the injectors, the taps connecting the tender to boiler. This gradually cools the engine and reduces the boiler pressure. Then comes the task of removing the fire. Again, on some of the more modern engines, the fire can be dropped through the bottom of the firebox. But here, it has to be shoveled out by hand and dropped through the floor of the cab. Hot work, cramped work, using cumbersome large tools in a small space. It is this, the simple amount of labor needed to make the engines work that brought about the end of steam. nothing to touch them. Their days are numbered and the real veterans are being broken up. Here at Swindon, where many thousands have been built over the past hundred years or so, the old timers have been turned into scrap. Rather sad, really, and it does seem a harsh fate after all the faithful service they've given. Most of this lot date from the 1920s, but they won't be quite forgotten there's a big demand for the old number plates as souvenirs for collectors. Still progress is progress, I suppose, and British Railways must diesel up. When he joined the Incredibly, railway, steam on Britain's railways lasted only a little longer than horses. The last shunting horse ending service in 1967. The past six years, he's been at Newmarket Station pulling horse boxes for racehorses. But Charles had his share of the limelight. Two years ago, he appeared at the Horse of the Year show. I employ horses on the railways while well, it keeps the grass down on the platforms. Anyway, grass will now be playing a big part in Charlie's life. He's retiring to be replaced by a diesel. Obviously, Charlie's driver regrets the change, feels dark batting a diesel, and they do absolutely nothing for the gun. As it became clear that an age was about to pass away, people began to realize the steam railway was a thing worth saving. Here, 4472 Flying Scotsman, 40 years on, now is British Railways 60103. is about to pass into private ownership and preservation. The engine was to be followed by many more.
These scenes are typical of the last days of steam. A stopping passenger train pulls into a small rural station. Sadly, no one gets out. An express double-headed by Class 5 4 6 has just overtaken a heavy freight. The freight, hauled by a Class 9 2 10 the same class as Evening Star. West Country, a small local train hurries by on a branch line, perhaps soon to be axed. On the Great Western Main Line, a castle destined for scrap thunders by. Would enthusiasts give to spend a day just watching through the windows overlooking the Paddington approaches in the early 1960s? Today, the names of the old railways live on the preserved lines of Britain. Locomotives, perhaps with new boilers and new wheels, still work. Perhaps on lines that are a little too small for their power. The names of famous expresses live on, adorning locomotives that are not perhaps quite right, as stars of countless home movies. The steam locomotive is probably one of those technologies which, if it were to be invented today, would not be allowed.
The bean counting accountant will give a host of reasons why you cannot run a commercial railway based on burning coal to boil water to make steam. The truth remains that as long as there are steam locomotives in this world, there will be people who will want to clean them, oil them, fire them, drive them, photograph them, film them. There will be people who will want to ride behind them. Just watch them. Simply love them.